Hi everyone, my name is Riley Keene. I'm the CEO of Caracorder, and today I'm going to be giving a lecture titled A Brief History of Corded Text Entry. As a full disclaimer, I have never given a lecture before, and I'm also involved in the manufacturing and distribution of these cording enabled devices, which I am planning to cover at the end of this video. I'm not going to get too into the weeds of my devices personally. I want to keep this video as objective as possible because I couldn't find a similar video to this on the internet and I think this history is very rich and important. So I hope you learned something today and let's get started. I'm also going to share our company mission to give you a little bit of background at the lens that I'm looking at this through. So the mission of Caracorder is to raise average human typing speed, which is currently at 40 words per minute up above and beyond 250 words per minute. That is the equivalent of the average adult's reading comprehension speed and also how our company defines the speed of thought. The first invention I'm going to cover is the typewriter, even though it is not a cording enabled device, because um, it has the most impact on um, human output speed of any invention that was ever created and it also has inspired every single other invention that is on this entire timeline. Um, so the typewriter, which most of you are hopefully aware of, was so important because the average person could only write with a pen and paper at 13 words per minute. Uh, and this brought that all the way from 13 words per minute up to 40 words per minute and that has remained the average um, text output speed of a human being since that invention. Nothing on uh, this entire timeline has really been able to move the needle in a meaningful way outside of the typewriter. So I can't emphasize how important uh, this innovation is to the entire ecosystem on this timeline. The other distinguishment that I want to make that uh, is not made anywhere on the internet that I can find is the difference between Mac recording and mic recording. If you search cording keyboard on the internet, there's no, uh, th these are categorically the same, which is crazy because they're totally different classes of peripheral devices. They're totally different use cases and um, they, they need to be separated. So hopefully this video will, will start to um, help people be better informed on that because there's a lot of conflation. There's a lot of confusion going on around this. Starting with this device here, uh, by Miles and Bartholomew. He's referred to as the father of the stenograph. However, this device by uh, the modern definition is in no way, shape or form a stenograph because it is mic recording. And mic recording means that you're pressing lots of buttons at the same time to output an individual letter. So in the case of this device, basically the only information available on this is the patent. Uh, there's a needle uh, or sorry, a, a spool which is passing over the top of the device. The left hand and the right side of the device are completely mirrored, so there's only five distinct inputs. For example, this ring finger triggers the same exact needle as the right ring finger. And you get this sort of Morse code style output on the top. The thought behind the design, from what I can see, this is the actual model that he, that he sent in with his patent, uh, from what I can find. And the thought behind the design is that you're alternating your left and right hands moving up and down, just getting one letter each time. I believe his intention was to reduce finger travel, which he thought would make you type faster. But the oversight is uh, the same reason why, for instance, somebody with dual twiddlers, I'll cover the twiddler later, cannot type as fast as a QWERTY keyboard. The typewriter is faster than this stenograph because whenever you type a word, you're, you're probably, let's say I'm typing um, type, T-Y-P-E. Whenever I hit the E key, if I'm typing really fast, the T key is probably still pressed. So it's like a burst fire. It's like a <laughs> and when you're doing a, a, a micro cording entry, the difference is that it requires you to release all keys before you move on to the next letter. So in the practice of sonography today, this is colloquially referred to as finger spelling, and it is widely accepted and widely known to be much, much, much slower than even ordinary typing. 
that is again the process of cording multiple letters to output sorry multiple buttons to output individual letters whereas macro cording is the practice of pressing multiple letters to output entire words or at least a syllable or other part of a word and the first mac recording device that i could find on the internet is this one the 1889 anderson shorthand typewriter i'm going to talk about this at the same time as i discuss and introduce the wardstone island stenograph which is basically the same as the modern stenograph that the company stenograph manufactures and the only difference really in these two devices is the layout they work more like a typewriter than this morse code style output uh, punching a, a a sequence of letters onto this reel as it passes through the device and because um, you have a lot more different combinations of potential keys uh, then you can also get a uh, millions of possible outputs of combinations of these letters. You have to, of course, be trained in shorthand to be able to read this. Let's look at some examples here. For instance, if I wanted to type uh, the court, it would just be all of these letters together. If I wanted to type period, it would be these letters together. together. If I wanted to type your, this one it almost looks like a slang shorthand. This one actually sort of makes a little bit of sense. But for the most part, a lot of these are just not going to uh, be human readable to an average English speaker. So in this day and age, uh, this device was built so that somebody in a courtroom could be able to keep up with the speed of human speech and then someone after uh, the trial or after the, the session, they would go and they would take this reel and they would translate that using a typewriter, a, a normal QWERTY typewriter, uh, to produce that transcript uh, and send those out to everybody that ordered them. And Wardstone Island, I would say, was very different from Mr. Anderson here, because while they were both inventors, Wardstone Ireland was very ambitious, and he was very much about uh, pushing his device out there, creating the uh, educational infrastructure for people to learn how to use it, and very uh, disruptive and not afraid to like try and uh, prove how much better this was than than shorthand writing, which it is faster and consistently better. Uh, I love shorthand, by the way. I'm not going to cover like Greg shorthand in this video, but it is very, very cool. And I recommend you um, look into that as well if you're interested. This is the layout of a modern stenograph, which is basically the same. Uh, the the steno community, what has come to to be known as a stenograph now, is is very dogmatically adherent to this layout this has not really changed in any meaningful way and it basically the there's um there is a chronological sequence to the device whereas the left hand of the device is, the, is meant to be the first half of the word the right hand device is meant to be the second half of the word whereas the middle of the device with the thumbs uh, is meant to be the vowels the vowel sound sort of connecting those consonants and as you can see, like a full-size keyboard has 104 buttons on it, whereas this one has 22. And there's some letters that aren't even present uh, because it's, it is phonetically based. For instance, if you want to get a, a G sound, there is no G key. You press T and P and K and W together in order to get that sound. Uh, and that's the, um, the modern standard of stenography. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in this Mac recording category. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back in a little bit. I think I'm sort of improvising as I go here. But if you if you look at the progression of the stenograph since that invention, in in my perspective, in my opinion, there's really only two major changes, uh, significant changes in the entire lifespan of this device up to the modern day. The first is the advent of software which is significant because it allows for real-time captioning and real-time reporting. So rather than producing this reel, um, it's, it's obviously it's taking those inputs and it's producing a, um, a live transcript. So if you're really, really good on a stenotype machine, and still today, very few people have a real-time certification in stenography. Uh, these are like the elite, like Navy SEALs of, of stenographers. Um, my, my good friend, Miss Steno, would be an example of that. She's amazing. And I would uh, also say that the open sourcing of that software is the second major innovation in the form of Plover. 
if you want to learn stenography for free, Plover is, is the go-to. Definitely go download Plover and you can try stenography at least in some limited capacity on whatever keyboard that you own. Uh, so you can see these machines are quite expensive. One of the barriers of entry to stenography, the double-edged sword of the, of the software side is that the stenograph company uh, sort of also discovered that, oh, we can um, start charging people an annual fee in order for them to use their device. So in addition to paying thousands of dollars for a device, they were also charging um, the, the uh, vocational professionals to pay thousands of dollars a year just to be able to use their device and their software. And uh, Plover has, has disrupted that, I would say, still in the process of disrupting that to, to make um, this process and capability um, available to everybody. So can't recommend that enough. And I'm gonna take a step back to this device here. This is called the Taco Type, uh, invented in 1933. This was uh, the only device actually on the entire timeline, which is halfway between Mac recording and mic recording. And that is because it has uh, some dedicated letter keys. I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip ahead. So this is this transformed eventually into what's called the Velotype. Uh, this is the modern version of it. It costs $1,500. I don't even know if you can still buy it. I went to their website while I was making this uh, and I got 404 when I tried to go to the product page. But they have, as you can see here, there's a lot of individual letter buttons, um, but they still, I think for like the B key and there's there's several consonants where you still need to microcord. You still need to press multiple letters to output, uh, multiple buttons to output individual letters. And um, this is also a company that I really, really, really love. I think that as far as what they've accomplished, um, they are probably the closest uh, to doing what Caracorder aims to do in bringing the power of corded text entry to the masses. I think they were, they were very close. Um, and I hope that somebody will use their theories and their layouts and, and build devices powered by Caracorder engine in the future to um, build off of what they've already created. I'm also going to take a step back and look at this, the typing timeline at the top here. Um, there's been a, a few other different layouts outside of QWERTY, QWERTY uh, most notably the Dvorak keyboard, that have just not really um, become widespread, at least enough to replace the QWERTY keyboard. And I wanted to talk about why that is. Uh, so, of course, replacing a 100-year-old habit is really, really, really hard. But I, I think, uh, from what I have observed, the reason why something like the Dvorak wouldn't replace the QWERTY is, is simply because the potential speed gain is too small. There's, there's a lot of really fast typers out there. In fact, the fastest typers of the world still use QWERTY and outside of, of QWERTY typists, uh, character entry typists, the fastest character entry typists in the world still use QWERTY. And they say that it doesn't matter what layout you use. There's a couple of studies that show like somewhere between like 10 and 15% potential speed improvement by switching to Dvorak. Um, it does have a little bit better of left versus right hand optimization. There's a lot of other layouts, just switching the keys around, still using the one dimensional switches that people have, have used or have done studies on to um, try and algorithmically produce what is the most efficient layout and relearning how to type for like a 10 to 15% gain is just not enough for most people. Um, the other device I want to cover in the typing category, again, these are not cording enabled devices, is the data hand. So this was the first device that allowed for multi-directional, multi-dimensional text entry. In addition to, um, the, so you can hit these buttons in cardinal directions. You can see there's a, sort of a cluster of buttons around each finger um, in order to type not too dissimilar from how the, the Caracorder 1 works, which I'll get into later. And there's a great ergonomic study I would encourage you to dig into here that shows both a speed increase from using this multi-directional um, input as well as an ergonomic benefit. And there's some crazy testimonies out there. Uh, it's my opinion that the, um, the large amount of mechanical components uh, inside of this device is one of the reasons why it wasn't commercially successful in the long term. Uh, the cost of repairs and the cost of manufacturing was just very high. So it cost over $1,000. This is back then. 
This is in the 80s. This cost over $1,000. Uh, so you can at least double that to, to um, put into perspective what that would cost in 2023. But there's these still will sell immediately whenever they go up on eBay. Um, there's some crazy testimonies about, like, this guy says it cured his tendonitis whenever he started using it. And the reason is, uh, from an ergonomic perspective, when you're looking at things like carpal tunnel and repetitive strain injury, um, hitting the same buttons with the same motion over and over and over again, you know, the more repetition you have, the more repetitive strain injury you have. So by using multiple muscles in your fingers, um, by using not just the downward motion, the um, um, I won't get too much into detail, um, not the flexion muscles or the extension muscles or the abduction and adduction muscles, using all of those together will basically reduce repetition in your muscle groups and, um, and also reduce repetitive strain injury. All right, where were we? So I talked about why this didn't commercially take off. Um, let's go down back to microcording. This is a study done in 1990. Actually, I don't know when the study was done. The device was invented in 1992, and the study was done at my alma mater, Georgia Tech. Uh, it's pretty incredible that somebody was able to get over 70 words per minute on this device. I was very impressed by that. I actually have a Twiddler 3 here, and I was never able to pass like 20 words per minute on it. It's really, really hard because of what I talked about before. You have to release keys before you move on to the next key. Um, but it's a, it is a prime example, I think the best example, in my opinion, of um, using the benefits of microcording for a, a very specific use case, and that is portability. So this was designed for one-handed typing, and microcording is a good option for that because otherwise you just you don't have enough buttons in order to access all the inputs you would need to utilize a computer. So I highly recommend this product as well, the Twiddler 3. Um, but... This, I guess, with a lot of practice, this will give you a good idea of how fast you can get on these devices. Uh, compared to Mac recording devices, it is very, 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 very slow. Um, frog pad, we don't need to get into too much detail. I don't even think they ever officially launched. This is another one-handed mic recording example. Um, they tried to launch twice in 2014 and 2012, and I don't know if they were ever successful. So we've talked about why mic recording um, has not become uh, commercially successful and widespread. We've talked about why alternative keyboard layouts haven't been successfully widespread or why uh, things like the data hand um, were not commercially successful and widespread. Let's talk about why stenography has not been, um, has been commercially successful, I would say, but has not been become widespread as a keyboard replacement. So we talked about having 22 keys and also about how a full-size keyboard has over 104 keys. We use a keyboard for a lot more than just outputting words, right? Um, so it is it is possible. It is possible to use a, a stenograph as a total keyboard replacement. There's only one guy in the entire world that I know of that has actually done that. Um, the, the top stenographers in the world, I was very, um, very surprised to learn, do not use a stenograph for most of their human computer interaction. Whenever they're typing emails or uh, editing their transcripts, no matter what they're doing on their computer, they're probably still using a QWERTY keyboard. And they're so they'll take their, one of the things they told me the first time I went to a stenography class is that you're going to spend more time typing on a QWERTY than you are on your stenograph. So you go into the courtroom, you're banging out your, your chords or your captioning or whatever your, um, your job is, and then you're going to go and you're going to take that transcript and you're going to spend um, probably, especially if you're new, several hours editing that transcript to to create um, the end document. And it's incredibly hard to learn stenography. There's a, on a good day, I would say that being becoming a stenographer, getting certified in stenography is, based on the attrition rates, twice as hard as becoming a U.S. Navy SEAL. And there's some schools that have like a 1% graduation rate. It is just incredibly difficult. The average age of a stenographer right now is in the 50 to 55 year old range. And most of them are expected to retire within the next couple of decades. So the stenograph company is making a very radical shift, much to the, sh the chagrin of their uh, current customer base to like voice technology. And 
um, I don't want to get too much into the drama of uh, voice reporters versus uh, stenotype reporters versus digital reporters. There's all this um, crazy disruption going on in this industry right now that I'm not going to um, get into. But I will say that the NCRA and stenography schools need to do better about this. This is is insanely low. At the very minimum, they need to graduate people at the rate that US medical students are graduating. Like they need to increase this by um, by, by many, many, many times over uh, because they are losing students. There's an entire generation that's just, it's just not there. Uh, and there's a lot of demand for these jobs. That's the other crazy thing. Um, so I, I hope also that Caracord technology can help this industry, but that's enough about that for now. Getting back to the diagram, I want to invite you to recalibrate and think about with me, what is the future of corded text entry? I respect stenographers more than I respect doctors for these attrition rates alone. Like what they're able to overcome, what they're able to accomplish is absolutely incredible and I get it. I think the pursuit of hyperfluency with machines is not only a noble pursuit, but is more important today than it ever has been in the digital age that we live in. Outputting text in the same unit that you think in words is, is an absolutely incredible and I want everybody to experience it. But right now, it's safe to say that with so many people full-time trying to learn this and failing, that in its current state, stenography is not for everyone. And I think that we need to keep innovating. I don't think there's anything wrong with stenography. I know I'm not the most popular guy in the stenography community, but I love stenography and I want it to continue to exist. Not only that, I want all of these technologies to, to live on. I, I don't wanna see these die. And that's one of the reasons why I created Caracorder. And I hope you will stay with me while I tell you a little bit about it. The name Caracorder is a portmanteau of character and cord. And the whole philosophy behind all of these devices is that neither uh, flexibility of typing one letter at a time or the speed of typing a whole word at a time, neither of those things is more important than the other. Neither should be prioritized over the other, but rather that those two things should be working together in harmony. And these devices are the only ones on the timeline which fall under both the Mac recording category and the typing or character entry category. So I'm gonna start with the Caracorder Lite here. This is the one that, for especially for QWERTY typists, I believe um, helps people understand what is Caracorder the fastest. So the beauty of, of this system is that it's immediately additive. If you're using a Caracorder Lite, you don't have to relearn how to type. You can still use it the exact same as you would an ordinary keyboard, and it's a great keyboard by itself. But let's say you type 75% of a sentence and character entry, just like you normally would. And then bam, 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 you bang out four or five different chords. You're not switching modes. You're just changing the timing that you're pressing those keys. And then after you finish those chords, you can just go straight back to typing one letter at a time in character entry for those words that you, you don't have chords for yet. So even if you only were to build muscle memory for a hundred chords, that's 50% of written English. That's how repetitive our language is. So this ability to, um, to slowly or quickly, whatever rate is comfortable for you to, to be able to introduce uh, new chords and new muscle memory into your workflow is, is something which doesn't really exist on any of the other systems that you see in this timeline. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Caracorder is so powerful and has so much potential. The other thing that really separates Caracorder from uh, the other products on this timeline is that it's not a product. It is a platform and an ecosystem. So while we do provide our own solutions, we also are, are equally driven to provide tools for others to build their own solutions. Uh, and there's no strict adherence to any particular layout. Like the Caracorder 1 and Caracorder Lite are completely separate. And there's no reason why you can't use Steno-based chords and theories on a Caracorder Lite. There's no reason why you can't use the Dvorak or the Colmac layout on a Caracorder Lite. There's no reason why you can't remap your Caracorder 1 to use a data hand inspired layout. 
and there's no commercial restrictions on using this, the chip module, the Caracorder engine, to build uh, anything inspired by anything you see on this timeline and selling it and scaling it yourself. When we say we want to get the whole world typing at the speed of thought and using corded text entry, we mean that. And we know that we can't do it ourselves. Um, so we want to partner and, um, and spread the love. So the Caracorder X is the last thing I'm going to cover in this because I don't want this to turn into a uh, marketing video about Caracorder. This is a dongle we crowdfunded last year. You can plug in any keyboard into the female end and plug it into your computer and it'll give your keyboard some of those cording capabilities. So I'll end it there. We have plenty of demo videos and you know more marketing style videos that you can look up if you're interested. Uh, as much as I would love you to check those out, I would also encourage you to also check out um, history of all the other products on this timeline. So please fact check me, please ask questions, please let me know if there's other devices that you think should be included on this timeline, uh, even if they're not core to text entry devices. Uh, I love learning about this stuff and there's, there's thousands of different of types of keyboard out there. Um, which is why I think an open platform is so, so, so important if we're actually going to make our mission a reality. Uh, thank you for making it this far into the lecture. I hope I didn't rant too much, um, but I am planning on starting to do some more long form content this year. And this is sort of a first experiment with, uh, in that. So if there's other videos you want me to make, if there's other content that you want to see, if there's any of the devices on here that I covered, but um, you would like to learn more in depth about, please let me know. Even if it's not even Caracorder related, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so that's it. That concludes my lecture, and this was fun. Uh, thanks for joining me on this adventure.